Well, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Cole Whiteman. I come from the University of Michigan. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you to the uh, DryNet Program Committee and uh, Jay Carlson in particular for uh, inviting me. Uh, I, uh, uh, I also wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, uh, Professor uh, Delure, who, those of you who uh, were at the dinner last night, heard his uh, fine talk on the history and importance of data preservation, which uh, uh, I think hopefully leads smoothly into what I have to say here. Uh, I'm going to be talking about designing the workflow for a digital data repository because that's what you are doing, or that's what the DryNet staff is doing. You've got a fine looking uh, mechanism. Uh, navigation looks great. It's very inviting. All the pieces look like they're in place in a mechanical way. And now you're at the stage where, uh, uh, as, as, as you're looking toward getting it out there and open for contributions, uh, this is one of those wonderful times where you're asking all the questions or the design, you're asking the design questions of uh, uh, a lot of little details that add up to uh, larger policies about how to run a repository. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the repository that I'm working for uh, because it, uh, we've gone through a lot of those questions. Some of them keep coming up in, um, as time goes on, but uh, maybe some of the questions we've had to face and answer in the design of our repository might be uh, relevant to yours. So, where do I work? I work at a place called ICPSR. As Jake said, it's the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research. It is housed at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And it's uh, one of the world's oldest and largest social science data archives. And by oldest, I mean 1962 is when it was founded. Um, in uh, internet time, that's like back to the pyramids. Uh, way back when, uh, the way that the Institute would um, distribute the social science data collections uh, originally was on punched cards, and uh, there we go, uh, and then on uh, nine track tapes, and now it's all on the web. And uh, if you would like to explore what we have, uh, here's the URL. It's uh, Basically, it's, if you just think ICPSR, if you can get the order of those letters right, it's, uh, uh, then you can, uh, you can uh, find us. Um, how big is ICPSR? It's, um, there we go. Here's some numbers indicating the scale of our operation. Uh, as, I said, as you can tell in the title, it's a consortium with institutional members, the institutions being um, uh, typically uh, universities, research centers, government agencies, uh, mostly in the U.S., but also very much all over the world. Uh, and currently we have se about 700 uh, members, including this fine university here. Uh, the holdings consist, we, we organize our holdings in uh, studies, research studies, as in, um, well, we have about 7,000 of them, and in turn those consist of about 65,000 data sets, which in turn consist of uh, uh, over half a million individual files. Now, are these things just sitting gathering digital dust, or are they actually being used? They're actually being used. We had uh, over 600,000 data set downloads last year, and were these all from just a few um, cultish fans? No, they were from uh, uh, almost 20,000 uh, active uh, users. So, how does, what is the impact of ICPSR on social science? Um, well, here's how we help. And this ought to sound kind of familiar because this is what you're trying to do uh, for your uh, research community. Um, having a reliable, easy to navigate data repository enables the world of social science, as both as users and as depositors, uh, several benefits. Uh, as users, you can explore and under understand, evaluate the original findings of a research study down to the minutest detail. Uh, you can, uh, uh, if you want to replicate it, you've got the starting point, uh, and you can uh, extend it, the original findings with secondary analysis. And if you're a depositor, uh, you've got an incentive to deposit your social science research data with us, 
because that allows you to offload the arduous ongoing task in perpetuity of preserving data accessibility to the research community. Um, also, we protect it for you from damage, loss, uh, obsolescence of various kinds like media obsolescence, format obsolescence. Um, uh, if you uh, really love to receive uh, phone calls and emails from your, your data users uh, asking you for a, every possible kind of help, well, that's fine. You can still do that. But uh, insofar as a lot of the user support questions are just, well, where do I find your file and which version? Sh a lot of the basic questions, maybe it's nice to offload that to uh, another organization that is hosting the files. Now, some people, whether they really uh, see those benefits or not, they're, they're obliged to archive their uh, research files somewhere or provide for long-term access as a, um, uh, as a requirement from their, uh, their sponsor, their funding agency. So, whereas, uh, it, so you could, if you wanted to, if you have a grant and you're collecting data, um, you could respond to your funding agency with, you know, well, we'll come up with this 15 element plan to create a, create a, a file area that um, will hook in with some um, hosting provider and we'll, um, we'll keep it staffed and we'll make sure that everything is properly curated over time. That's a lot of effort. You have to think of a lot of things. Or you could just say, oh, well, we're, we're giving a, our research data to ICPSR, problem solved. So that's, that's how we try to help. Now, what does ICPSR look like? What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you how the repository looks, first from the outsider's point of view, and then I'll take you on a little tour through the inside. Um, here's a, uh, don't worry about the little the fine print here, but basically this is when, when, um, when, when I give my, my usual show for here's our ICPSR, here's a little something I can hand out that shows what we look like. We're, we're an opaque box. We're a mysterious box where magic happens. Um, we serve the world of political and social research. Uh, investigators contribute, um, uh, contribute their data collections to us in a variety of uh, formats, or sometimes ICPSR staff will go out and obtain uh, publicly accessible uh, data collections, like the U.S. Census, for instance. Um, and either way, material goes in, and then um, this is not one of those operations where it comes in and just immediately goes out. Uh, we do a lot of, as you'll see, we do a lot of uh, value-added uh, effort. Do a lot of value-added We do a lot of effort to add value to uh, uh, what we take in. So after thorough quality assurance on various levels and cataloging so it is easier to find and it's all in standard uh, formats and available to researchers who use different um, statistical, statistical software packages. After all of that thorough uh, combing and uh, cleaning and packaging, uh, we put the data collection out to the web for current day researchers and we archive it uh, and replicate it for uh, future researchers. So that's what, that's what ICPSR's role in the world of research is. The uh, other outsider's view that mo most people who are connected with the ICPSR world uh, think of us as our uh, front page of our uh, website, and here's what it looks like. Um, and uh, you can go there. And uh, I encourage you to go there if you're curious and explore around, and you can drill down, and you can wander around, and you can browse, and there's all sorts of different ways of finding what you want, including just a search box. And you can just type anything of interest to you. So, and I, I encourage you to go there and just type something interest, like, for instance, drought. I typed drought the other day, and I, it gave me a result list of 373 uh, studies that had the word drought in it somewhere. I mean, maybe some of them were, maybe there's a PI out there whose name is Drought. I don't know. But, um, but uh, so then I drilled down, and here's, here's one in particular. Here, so here's a sample front page for a given one of those 7,000 studies. 
uh, Great Plains population and environment data, agricultural data, 1870 through 1997 in the United States. Um, so that might be interesting, and you can, you can uh, quickly download it, or you can, uh, uh, um, you can just, uh, even before downloading it, you can read all about it. There's a, there's a lengthy study description, documentation, view-related literature, and so forth. Um, uh, and so that's, that's kind of what the world of ICPSR is about. It's about making this really easy to find and really easy to get to. I think, by the way, this is the only slide that I have in the entire presentation that has the word drought in it. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, another outsider's view, uh, Touchpoint, if you're not a user but a um, depositor, a, a contributor, um, we have uh, a, um, uh, a book called the Guide, Guide to Social Science Data, Pre Data Preparation and Archiving. Here it is. In fact, if you're curious, I brought a bunch, and they're sitting uh, kind of back there um, uh, in front of Mark. And um, I encourage, feel free to uh, pick one up. There's a, another little bit, other little bits of ICPSR literature if you're curious. Um, and this is the uh, distillation of thousands of conversations over half a century with prospective depositors um, because there's a lot of back and forth we have with the depositors in the, in the, in the contribution process. Uh, and there's a, uh, a lot of advice here about how to prepare your data in the first place to make the preservation effort uh, smooth rather than rough. Um, if, if I were to go through that with you, that's, that's like a two-hour show. Um, but basically, the, uh, if you look in the guide, it breaks down the... Um, uh, a typical uh, research project into seven steps for this purpose, with each with its own, uh, uh, the data being at a part in a life cycle, and it's got all this advice under each step for here's, here's what to do so that when you get to the archiving step, um, things go very easily. And there's, here's a few nuggets of advice, but basically the essential advice in the whole book is um, when you're doing a research project, uh, instead of leaving all your thinking about data preservation as an afterthought, let's just get the whole thing out and then we'll worry about preservation later. Instead, think, think about it from the very beginning and do a few little extra pieces of effort at each step just so that it becomes very easy at the end. And this guide is all about here's, here's, here's what to think about. So I'll encourage you to take a look at that. Now, of course, it's, it's all game aimed at uh, social scientists, and um, one, as we'll see, one uh, big piece of effort that might not be relevant to you folks uh, has to do with um, the fact that most of the, uh, or a great many of the data collections that we deal with uh, are responses from uh, human beings, and therefore we get very concerned about confidentiality and potential uh, risk of disclosure of sensitive information and so forth. So you, you probably, most of you don't have to worry about that kind of thing, dealing with rainfall and soil samples, but, um, uh, but otherwise. Okay, so now, what does ICPSR look like on the inside? What's in that mysterious opaque box? Well, here's, here's a, a high-level map of our uh, internal process, it's our internal pipeline for what we do with data deposits that we receive on the left and they, they wend their way through this, uh, uh, this game here until they pop out the end where they become accessible. And um, uh, th this, is, this is the basis also for like training we give new staff and it takes about an hour to go through this, but I'll, I'm just going to whiz through this in, in how about 12 minutes? One minute for each step. Um, but uh, uh, first, just the um, notation I'm using. Um, uh, very simple. Uh, each of those circles is a task. And, the, and at this high level, they're like really, really major tasks, like deposit a uh, study. Uh, and every task gets inputs uh, and uh, produces output for other tasks. or other or from or to other resources. Uh, every task has an owner, a group, or a person who is uh, preferably a group that is uh, responsible for getting that task done. Uh, if uh, 
a task has multiple owners, then at a lower level of detail, um, who owns what ought to be teased out more. If a task has no owner, it probably won't get done. So every task ought to have an owner. Um, and as I said, each one of those bubbles, each one of these tasks at the high level, for each one of those, there's actually a big map that's on our wall, that's not, not far from my office, um, breaking it down into uh, small, very concrete, actionable steps that our staff can follow to do, to do each piece. Here's just a little snapshot of just like the upper left corner of, um, of, um, uh, of, of one of those steps, the, the actual deposit uh, where this is where we can show all the detail about the different ways that material can come in and different decisions and, and how uh, loops can happen and decisions and, and we can hook it up with um, uh, the particular uh, tools that we use and so forth. So that's, uh, that's kind of how we maintain some understanding about how this uh, enormous contraption uh, works. Like anything else, it looks kind of small from the outside and you get into it and on the inside it's a, it's a big world, you know? So uh, some, another uh, value we have on organizing the workflow graphically this way is that it, um, it's made it uh, pretty straightforward to have an internal website just for use by staff to go, that lets you go step by step and organize all of the um, all of the supporting tools and documents that you need for each step. And I, I should say that we're, I'm talking about, like the, or, the organization has um, about 120 people, staff members, about 80 of whom are somewhere in that diagram. They have some role. So there's, uh, there's an ongoing need for new staff to learn it and old staff to kind of keep up with procedures. So, so for, here's an excerpt from the web page for step two, where you see the little focus graphically on what goes into and out of that step, and then you can click your way, if you're a staff member, to everything you need to understand it and actually perform that step. So you make one of these diagrams, and you can use it for all sorts of different purposes, including not to mention presentations. So, Okay, so um, any questions be quickly before I start just walking through these steps? That's fine. Uh, step one, well, where, where to start on the process? I like to start when I do process mapping one step before and kind of go one step after the core process itself. So I, I like to start with just getting the very, when, before the deposit happens, somebody has to get the idea. Somebody has to connect uh, to recognize that a particular data collection ought to be deposited with ICPSR. And that can be somebody on our staff or it can, be, uh, it can be the researchers themselves or anybody else. Somebody identifies a data collection and you know, once, once it actually, we have actually a title and a defined owner for a data collection that, and an intention to deposit, once you can put your finger on that, it's, um, that starts the conversations that lead to, uh, lead to the deposit. The deposit itself, um, uh, that is, uh, the output of that is um, that the organization, re that ICPSR receives uh, a directory full of files and documenta uh, of data and documentation. Uh, we uh, receive a database record uh, of metadata that came along with the deposit. And also from the investigator, uh, we have a, an electronic signature giving us custody of the data, just for, for repository purposes. No, uh, um, we, uh, once, we, um, once we have that, that, that gives us the right to do what we must to uh, preserve it. Um, the distinction between depositor and investigator, um, it's sometimes the same person, uh, and sometimes it's different people. Sometimes the investigator is the person who is well, it's always the person who, is, who, who has owner, original ownership of the data and who can sign off, uh, uh, sign off on it. Um, the investigator might be depositing it him or herself or might have somebody else who we call the actual depositor, like a, like a grad student, do it, uh, uh, do it uh, on his or her behalf. 
Um, then there's a step three, reviewing and planning. Um, and uh, this is because we, we accept data collections in an enormous variety of formats, structures, content. Uh, there's, um, there are a few requirements we do put, but we, we're kind of out there to serve the community. We're not, we're not presenting a very narrow, rigid uh, set of requirements on how you must, how you must deposit this, because otherwise people wouldn't want to bother doing it with us. So the consequence of that is that there are a lot of choices that we often have to make in, um, at deposit time. We can't just blindly just let it through. For instance, uh, is, this, um, a, uh, is this deposit going into a, is this a new study for us, or is this uh, part of a study that we already have, some additional files? Uh, is it a new study, or is it a, an update to an existing one? Uh, if it's a new study, is it part of a series of studies that we're maintaining? Um, is, that, uh, uh, is it in English, or is it, in, is it described in some other language? Uh, are there any, um, anything unusual about the files themselves, the way they're structured? Um, is, there any, is there anything else that would cause us to alter the effort that we're going to do? So there's a planning step. And uh, uh, a staff member, who we call a processor, is assigned to it as a project. And uh, the, um, uh, the, um, if it's, and every study gets uh, an identifier, and so we link the deposit to a study, a deposit number to a study number, and we file a processing plan. And from then, uh, that launches a series of three steps which, which can be done concurrently, uh, where the, the goal is to build a clean set of data, a clean set of documents, and a clean study description, uh, also known as metadata. And that's what the next three steps are about. And there's, there's a little bit of back and forth between those three, but essentially I'll just kind of, I've said what they are. So the study description document set. And they all converge again after you've got those three things. They converge in a step where everything is assembled. There's a processor does a final review to make sure everything is consistent. The documents and the data and the metadata are all consistent with each other. Um, and then uh, at that point, the processor uh, turns it over, uh, kind of throws it over the wall to uh, another part of the organization that uh, manages the, um, the website where we publish everything. And that is, uh, and that uh, release coordinator will give it a final look for, um, uh, to, to make sure there's, there's a few quality things to check at an, at an ICPSR wide level. And then the uh, release coordinator will uh, release it, and then it goes out onto our web server for, um, for dissemination. That's where it becomes available to everybody. Uh, and then uh, we uh, announce the study on our website, or if you're a member of uh, any of several mailing lists, you might receive an email saying, because you're interested in this, in this uh, category of uh, study. There's also, as a separate track, um, there are, um, there are uh, many studies that we also separately do some extra preparation for online analysis. Uh, we have a, an online analysis package from, the, uh, from UC Berkeley that we uh, work with them closely to uh, support. And uh, so with a little bit of extra preparation by the processor, um, uh, we can generate additional files that make it possible for people to go online and not only download, but uh, do, um, do queries right online. So then that gets released as well. And that's a, we consider that a separate release from the, the, the initial uh, download release. And then finally, uh, users get to uh, access the study, and here's the breakdown of every, everything that they see. The, uh, uh, when a new study becomes available, uh, it becomes, uh, uh, you can find it in a search. Uh, there are various categories of uh, files that you get to download. There's a standard 
uh, standard struct set of files, um, and then uh, online uh, data analysis gets, uh, it appears there. So those are the, that's our 12, that's our 12 step program for um, uh, getting uh, material out there for use. Um, and of course, there are other repositories out there in the world that do this sort of thing, and every, everybody does it a little different. Here's a couple of unique things about ours. Um, one is, is that we, I think of it sometimes as one long pipeline, but it's actually kind of two because there's a rhythm of deposits coming in and studies going out. And frequently it's uh, one deposit becomes one study, but it's also possible for multiple, multiple deposits to go into one study or one deposit to get divvied up into multiple studies. Um, and also, as you've seen, uh, uh, we devote a significant effort to building these packages. This is not like a um, typical hobbyist file sharing site where people just throw things up and they immediately become available and you end up with this unmoderated heap of stuff. This is extremely moderated, it's extremely curated, it's extremely everything-aided. And uh, uh, that's, that accounts for all the effort we put in. Um, and uh, also, um, you might notice on the big diagram that there were some storage pieces there. And uh, you could imagine all of, all of our, the repository storage to be all one place. Here we have it in three different places at three different steps so we can apply different rules. That's just the way we do it. And by the way, I'm, I'm not going to say anything at all about you should do it the ICPSR way. That's not the point of this because of course, ICPSR is a very different organization and has very different funding model and incentives and, and history and structure and all that. This is more just to raise the questions. So typical design decision questions that you might be uh, facing. So uh, for instance, is your primary focus of effort on quick delivery once something is deposited or is your primary focus on preservation? How, how do you balance that? Because you could, you could do the workflow in a way that gets the deposit out there quickly, and then you kind of take care of all the preservation details. Or else you could, uh, uh, many people in the preservation community will uh, loudly say, no, 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 you should preserve first, and then access is just automatically happens because it's, it's in your repository. Um, what do you want to make easy, deposit? Preservation, delivery, well, of course you want to make them all easy, but sometimes there's a tension between the two. If you make one easy, you, 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 who's, who's going to do the effort? The, how much effort is done by the depositor and how much effort is done by the repository? Uh, what kind of requirements do you want to set on what can come in, um, uh, both on the data and the metadata? Uh, the preservation commitment. Um, when a data format becomes obsolete, which it will, because they always do, um, what are you going to do with the holdings you have in the old format? Um, so here we, uh, at our organization, we talk about a bitstream preservation commitment or an intellectual content preservation commitment. We'll, we'll, you know, in one case, we'll say, well, we'll, we'll just preserve the original bitstream as is, and that's it. And, but mostly what we, we say is we, we commit to preserving the intellectual content of it. That's where we might need to periodically convert your original file from word perfect into uh, some ancient word perfect document into something that, something that will uh, go on uh, further. And then of course, uh, can anybody deposit data? Can anybody access data? Questions like that. So um, that's my quick fly through. Uh, thanks very much. Um, let me know if there's anything um, I can do to help move the conversation along. Any questions first? Yes, sir. We are really behind on time, so if you can keep it quick, I'd really sure. appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Uh, do you know your user groups of this data set? Do we know the user groups? Yeah, or users. Who, who is using this data? Me personally, no, but um, with, except, with exceptions, but we do track that, yes, because every, everybody who goes in, um, uh, gets an account. It's very easy to get a user account, but um, uh, we can, we can, uh, we can, if you mean can we like characterize the audience? Yes. Okay. 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 Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Cole. I'll, I'll be around all day if you have further questions.